Welcome to the Maritime Standard webinar. I'm Clive Woodbridge. I will be the moderator or chairman for this session. It's a very important session where we're looking at the very topical and very important issue of CCNL and Wednesday, in particular mental health. I'd like to say thanks to our audience for attending. We've got one of our biggest attendees so far. I think it reflects the uh, topicality and the importance of this particular topic. Uh, also, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, Abu Dhabi Ports, Adnoc uh, Logistics and Services, um, CSP, Abu Dhabi, Terminals, and the um, Islamic P&I Club, without whose support these webinars um, over the pandemic period would not have been possible. And we thank them for their encouragement and support. I've got a great panel uh, to introduce to you shortly. Uh, all of whom have got a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, passion, I'd say, for this particular issue and are, and are, and are really engaged in it on a number of different levels. Um, Seafarer wellbeing is not a new issue, but I think there's no doubt that the pandemic has magnified it and, and put it under a lens. And now it is much more in the collective shipping industry consciousness. So while there is undoubtedly a lot of suffering and um, issues facing seafarers at the moment perhaps there is also a, a light at the end of the tunnel in the sense that uh, it's now very much uh, part of the conversation and shipping industry shipping companies have been made aware of it and perhaps that's something uh, that we can explore later on you know whether this is all bad news or whether in fact perhaps the pandemic um, could be unwittingly a force for good in 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 terms of moving the issue of so uh, a seafarer welfare to the centre of uh, corporate policy. So as I say, we've got, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have with us, uh, a, you know, a really top level panel. Um, Chris Peters is Chief Executive for eShips based in Dubai. Um, Chris has had a long experience in shipping and I know that seafarer welfare is something that's sort of close to his heart. He pointed out consistently during the uh, pandemic that seafarers are vital workers and has uh, put policies in place um, at eShips to reflect that. Uh, and he's also uh, at various panels in the past reflected on the fact that it's not just those that are sea that we need to be concerned about, uh, but those who are ashore wanting to go to sea, but who can't uh, do so for logistical reasons and that's impacting on their livelihood. So welcome Chris. Uh, Ali Shihab is an old friend. He's been with us on a number of uh, past webinars. He's now the Director of Maritime Advisory Services at BSICO, but was formerly the Acting CEO of uh, Kuwait Oil Tanker Company. The issue of seafarer mental wellbeing is something very near and dear to his heart as well. We hope at some stage during the proceedings to be able to welcome Andy Bowerman from the Mission to Seafarers. He, he's not with us at the moment, but uh, Reverend Andy, when, when, he, when he is uh, with us, will be an important contributor to this debate. Um, we've got Roger Harris, who's the Executive Director of the International Seafarers Welfare um, Network, is one. Um, Roger has been uh, a consistent champion of seafarer welfare. He's now running is one and we're delighted to have you with us, Roger. Um, Dr. Yasser Al-Wahedi, who's the director of the Abu Dhabi Maritime Academy. Um, he's uh, you know, uh, somebody who uh, knows how cadets are trained from their inception. And, and it's important that they are trained, the younger generation are trained with the, the issues relating to their mental health and general well-being in mind. So I think his his contribution will be very valuable. And welcome Dr. Fahad al obaid who's the medical advisor at the Kuwait Oil Tanker Company. I think it's it's good to have somebody directly involved in the medical issues and medical professions who can who can perhaps throw a very different light on seafarers well-being and how they're coping, the issues they're facing and so on. And last but not least we have Ray Deeks um, who has uh, uh, be, you know, suffered uh, issues in the, in the past himself and is using that experience and, uh, and, and as well as his, his experience in the shipping business to open up a coaching service uh, dedicated to um, 
those in the shipping industry and to companies who are looking for that kind of support. So it would be interesting to hear his perspective um, later on. So I'm just going to go around the room now, just open up uh, with, a, with a simple question to start with. And perhaps I'd like you know each individual speaker to identify what they feel the biggest single impact on C4 wellbeing has been of the pandemic. And I'll start with you, Chris. What what do you what would you highlight as being the key issue for you? Well, I think the um, the most common issue for all seafarers is the uh, crew changes or the lack of crew changes, the inability to do them in certain places. I mean, that became quite apparent fairly early on in the pandemic a year ago. And then unfortunately, uh, with the second and third waves of lockdowns that are now happening, we're seeing it again. And again, we, we need uh, support from everyone in the industry, governments, um, as well as companies, charterers, to actually permit crew changes in uh, difficult locations. So we can expand on that further as we talk, but for me, the single biggest issue is crew changes, both for those stuck on board for too long and those who have been ashore and want to come back to sea. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, Ali Shihab, what, what would you highlight? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Clive, and uh, a pleasure to everybody, and especially uh, our honourable guests here. And uh, more, very delighted that we have, you know, uh, all the corners really uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, with us here on a professional level, on the faith level, and then also on the uh, academic and uh, uh, medical. Now, I put it in a very simple uh, statement. Helplessness. People on board are helpless nobody is helping them and they can see that this situation is bad, getting worse and having to go through the situation uh, 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 simply into until something really change that feeling again helplessness yeah uh, reason we are here today reason i'm sitting and talking to you it's because I have a clear mind and I have the time to be with you. But the rest of I have a situation that really make me unable to attend, i.e. family emergency, something I have to attend to, you know, I, I, I would just say, sorry, I have to go. That's normal. But the guy who's on board the ship have no escape whatsoever. And that's what is the current feeling he is sitting there totally helpless and then he has to go through the feeling that his family back home have to survive the pandemic simple thank you okay thank you very much um, ali for those words um roger harris what what what, what you know from your organizations you've obviously been in touch with seafarers across the world what what do you think is the the key impact that this pandemic has had uh -huh. I think from our point of view, it's the increase in psychological stress on seafarers. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, when, when it hit um, roughly, uh, well, as we all know, about a year or so ago, uh, we, we ran a 24-hour helpline called Seafarer Help, and, and we started to experience three times the number of calls we normally receive. Uh, we're still getting a high level number of level of, of, of calls. Um, uh, a number related to psychological stress, but there are other factors con connect connected with that, obviously, because of the crew change um, crisis, as the previous speakers have talked about. But but things like the, the financial worry of seafarers uh, losing their jobs and not being able to get contracts, and, and that is helping to you know, create the conditions for much more stress. So that, that's the thing we, we've, we've seen. Um, a, a lot of it in, in, in the last year, and obviously we'll, we'll come on to talk about this uh, later on uh, on the panel. Thank you, Roger. Um, now, um, Dr. Yasser, from an academic perspective, what, what would you highlight as from your from your particular lens? Uh, what would you highlight as being the, the key impact of the pandemic on seafarer welfare, and, and, and what, what's your view on that? So from, uh, you know, whatever the other panelists, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, the, the, to this webinar. Whatever the other panelists have already highlighted, you know, are the major issues that uh, seafarers are experiencing. From a training and academic perspective, you know, the issues we faced 
in terms of uh, training were a bit milder, much milder than the others. Uh, what we lacked actually was this uh, notion of face to face training and education. So usually in a face to face training and education, when you have the instructor and the trainees in the same classroom, the instructor is able to communicate uh, his experiences or her experiences to the trainees in a very efficient way where it also it mixes up the emotions, right? The emotional when you, the emotional aspect that comes from face to face interaction is important to build up what we call mental resilience within the trainees. Now, during the pandemic, due to the, you know, the nature of the pandemic, uh, social distancing and so on, we had to rely on to deliver our uh, courses training and uh, these tools, while they allow the face to, you know, the video uh, uh, visual communication, but still this aspect of face to face communication, which uh, comes from really meeting face to face, the emotional aspect, the ability, the ability to convey emotions, ability to convey experiences, we have lost it due to the pandemic. So for me, I think in the academic side, this was the major uh, thing that we were really uh, suffered from, from the academic and training side. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasser. Um, Dr. Farhad, at the front line, what, 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 what are you seeing as being the main impact or the, or the single biggest impact? I think you might be on mute or... I am the, 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 oh, all right, that's better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it goes also with the fear and anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic. We are not sure and uncertain to what we are facing, and that created a lot of uh, anxiety and fear on, on board the vessels. Uh, people were afraid of uh, the port interaction and how we will interact with other ports, and they were asking for guidance and help. Uh, they were asking about the PPE and how it will be used and how it will be delivered to them. And do we have the enough uh, kind of safety equipment on board? Do we have enough medicine on board? Then once the pandemic uh, period gets extended, we, we issued the, the uh, issue of extended tour of duties on board the vessels. And the people started to feel of the fatigue and being exhausted. And then we noticed that um, kind of the incidence of O'Neill misses started, uh, started to increase and the safety uh, standard be began to become an issue. Uh, after that, we uh, began to suffer from other uh, medical, simple medical issue with the CPR joints with specific amount of medications that support them for the planned tour of duty. And now we are running shortage of medicine for them for treating their condition. And then we have to provide them and supply them with these vessels. So there was also disruption of the supply chain for uh, you know, the medical supplies and other supplies for all the vessels uh, sailing around the world. So it was a very big impact and big, big disruption for the operation uh, to our company. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhad. And, and, and finally, on this particular round of questions, as it were, uh, Ray Deeks, uh, how do you see the, the biggest impact from your perspective? Ray, are you there? I think we may have lost Ray again. Okay, well, if Ray comes back, we can, I can ask him that question. But I'll I'll come now to the to sort of some more detailed questions. And if anybody wants to sort of come in any time, please do let me know. But Chris, I mean, I know uh, e-ships is is, is 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 something that you have put very much to the centre of your corporate thinking, and 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 you you you've done some good work in this area. So perhaps you'd like to sort of perhaps take us through what steps uh, e-ships and the TriStar Group generally has taken to protect and and improve mental well-being of sea bearers and and and, and what, what what sort of particularly sort of different approaches have you taken in the pandemic i mean i think for us for eships twice star i mean this journey of uh, mental well-being of seafarers actually started before the pandemic we actually had um, our own inaugural um, maritime safety conference um, in November 2019, so before the pandemic actually occurred. And the main focus of that was the mental health of seafarers. It's something that we had seen um, on the increase was suicides. And again, it's something that we raised then and it's still not clear that um, the statistics are all there with the P&I clubs, but uh, they're not really out in the general domain. 
and it's the issues behind that. We've discussed this for many years now. Why were suicides on ships actually increasing? Um, it's a whole different um, topic to, to the pandemic uh, because there are underlying issues which the pandemic has exacerbated. So then, <clears throat> again, with the pandemic, we had already set up um, our own helpline, which is there not only for our seafarers, but for any seafarer. And that's a 24 hour um, manned line that people can call and get benefit. And we know that um, that has been used. I mean, from our side, we have um, implemented either myself or the COO of eShips. We called every single ship uh, one by one last year. I've recently, as uh, recent as last week, done another call with one of our vessels because all of the crew have been on there for um, too long. And unfortunately, the particular vessel in this case has been in Asia. She was traveling um, predominantly between China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and at no point could we do um, anything to get the crew off because none of those countries would allow it. So fortunately, we then managed to get a voyage to come back towards the Middle East, and we've now arranged crew changes. But I think just um, having the CEO of the company, getting on a video call with the ship, having a conversation and saying, look, you're not forgotten. Uh, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying. It, you can see um, smiles on faces and a boost to um, how they feel about what you're doing. It's, and as I said at my opening comments, trying to get governments um, to allow um, differences for seafarers. Again, I was on a call with um, the Indian Minister of Shipping with some other CEOs um, last month. <laughs> and again, we've asked for vaccination of all seafarers in that case. Indian seafarers, but that's something that we would like to promote and we would um, hope that seafarers can actually be um, registered as key workers. As we all know, 85-90% of global trade goes by sea and everything that's in our offices or our homes that we're all sat in right now, 85-90% of that has been on a ship at some point. So the seafarers should be classified as essential workers, the same as nurses, doctors, police, firemen, and we should get them priority um, for vaccination so that they can carry out their duties in a safer manner. So again, these are initiatives that we're trying to promote, but really individual companies are not able to actually do this on their own. We need to join together, we need to promote governments, and we need them to try and give different restrictions. We're um, about to spend a huge amount of money for a crew change in Australia, where we're going to take the crew off irrespective of what the regulations are, put them in quarantine for two weeks, and then they'll have to quarantine for another two weeks when they get back to their home countries. So it's finding ways, but we, sh in this scenario, the Australian government, we have contacted various people to say that these people should be able to come off the ship, be taken straight to the airport and put on a plane without having to sit somewhere for two weeks. And if everyone can lobby, the different governments or try and do it as unified in the industry, then maybe we can get seafarers moving off ships and more and as important, get other seafarers back to work who are losing income while they're not working. Mm. It seems logical, Chris, but why, why aren't governments listening to the shipping industry? Why, why, why is it just, what, what is it? Is it, is it that it's a failure of, of lobbying or is it just that they're not, um, uh, they, they, they don't understand shipping. What, what would you say the, the reasoning that you? Well, it's a think, logical thing for you to say, doesn't you know, that, that, to, that they, they should be able to go straight from a ship to a, a, a an airport and get on and, and go home. But wh why why are, why are people putting barriers in the way? Do you think? Well, I'm not a politician, but I assume that many governments. I'm not going to name any, but I'm assuming that people um, are just protecting their own. Mm. I, I don't know the answer. I'm not a politician, but it. People are trying to protect their own. We see uh, all the disputes going on in Europe between uh, the UK and particularly France and Germany over the availability of vaccines and is it going to be made available? There's a lot of people saying that um, people are hoarding vaccines. I've heard other countries apparently have uh, three times their population on order because they ordered from everywhere. But I'd, I think each nation is looking out for themselves and there needs to be um, more of a global initiative. I mean, we do hear on the news all the time that everyone is saying we need to vaccinate the world and people should be sharing. Um, that is probably correct, but politicians um, probably have a view that if they look after their own, they might get re-elected. 
I don't know. Okay, Chris. I, 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 can, I, can, I can be a politician and answer on your uh, behalf, uh, Chris, if, you, if you allow me. Of course, okay. go ahead, Alex. Seafair is not a priority, simple. Yeah, okay. That's, that's it. Don't, you don't, you, there, is, there is not much, you know, you have to be blunt in answering this question that mm. seafarers are not a priority. And then when you look at start of the pandemic, when all ports, what I mean, air, road, sea, everything was seized, but the sea was still operating. Yeah. And really, we, again, the system is failing as, as usual. Uh, the, the, the reason also, because now we said we are not a priority and number two, uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the industry is very fragmented. We operate in total isolation and that's where things start to go wrong. When we talk about the main stakeholders as in, in, in the regulatory and the industry, you know, they are working excellent. There is a lot of initiatives out there and really to give them their, you know, right, uh, 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 you know, uh, word and, and recognition, there has been fantastic initiatives from the beginning of the pandemic until today. But we're not succeeding. And the reason for not succeeding, obviously, again, it's flag states. And again, we come back into the government and how they are portraying what we're talking about here and where you see certain nations who see that the maritime industry as a priority, they put things ahead, whether it is on the human side or whether it is on the environment side. So I, I just wanted to uh, interact on this point, uh, Clive. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I, I'll bring it on. I mean, I mean how, uh, what, what, what types of, you know, obviously you, you said that perhaps uh, seafarers aren't a priority for uh, governments, but I'm sure they are a, a priority for uh, their employers. Uh, but what types of mental health support do you believe uh, seafarers need in the short and long term from the shipping industry? Or from number one, industry? yeah, number one, as a responsible ship operator, ship owner, you have to adapt irrespective of the case. And that's what we normally do. The situation is overwhelming and the adaptation process needs to be swift and fast. Now, it's all based on know-how and the kind of information that you are receiving. And that comes second item. First one is adaptation. The second one is communication. So like what uh, Chris just highlighted before, we've been communicating. We've, we've been out there. We've been talking to the people. So again, I, I, I take this opportunity and I thank the Maritime Standard. And we go back. Time is flying and going very fast and that's where history is being recorded 22nd of july 2020 clive we were on this webinar and what did we call it we called it live from the board room uh, to the bridge and what happened here we had all the ships and uh, we were talking to the ship staff while they were sailing yeah uh, and uh, we they were actually some of the ships masters they said excuse us we are going through uh, 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 you know a, a traffic separation or we are entering the port or something so how did we reach there how were we able to conduct that webinar in the manner we did it's because you have the infrastructure you paid you thought about this way back in 2004 when i was writing the specification for those ships and there was noises at the background and we say why would you want to spend this amount of money? And today we say, imagine if we did not do it then. It's because we needed to communicate and you make that ship shore connectivity uh, enabled. Now, when you do that communication facility available, then the other part, the buy-in, the feeling of you know uh, uh, ownership and responsibility and empowerment of the people, everything happens because as we are now, with a, a simple touch of a screen, we are connected and we can talk. And, and I don't know how many people are watching this and they're gonna watch this on the video later. So basically we have to do the right decision with the right impact 
that will really help the situation. Yeah, I hope I answered you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, absolutely. So getting the uh, getting the communications between ship and shore is, is crucial in your view, and 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 that's, that involves thinking ahead. Uh, right from the ground up in, in terms of designing your ships or retrofitting your ships uh, to uh, the actual procedures. Um, I'd like to come to Roger Harris now. I mean, uh, Iswan does a wonderful job uh, in in a number of respects, but I you know one of the, your latest campaigns, Roger, I believe, is around social interaction. I think you've got a, a programme called Social Interaction Man Matters. Perhaps you'd like to say a little bit about that and perhaps just explain why you why you feel that social interaction i presume that means both on board and sort of cross you know shore ship to shore uh why why that's important uh, um i mean it, 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 you know prior to the epidemic i mean over the last sort of i don't know five or six years we've become increasingly concerned about uh mental well-being and seafarers and, and i think one of the key factors one, one, one of the factors affects the mental well-being is, is the social isolation of seafarers and you know, the, um, um, you know, when we talk about communication, you know, one, one of the worries about increased internet, internet access on board and Wi-Fi on board is that crews retreat to their cabin. And, and uh, you know, we know with, with seafarers, with smaller crews, uh, with, with really, really hectic lifestyles on board, um, the, there's less and less chance to, of, of crews kind of coming together. So, so we, we've set up this project with funding from the uh, uh, MCA in the UK to look at um, what are the key, you know, sort of factors in so to, you know, in preventing what are the barriers to social interaction on board, and and then to look at what people are doing, and then and then also we're just running a trial at the moment with about uh, fourteen ships with, with uh, various companies, and actually looking at, uh, you know, what are they doing on board to, to to socially interact to bring the crew together. So, for example, about. You know, celebrating birthdays, uh, have, having competitions, quizzes, uh, and what we want to do is, is learn uh, fr fr from this and, and to pull together practical examples of, of what um, you know companies and, and crews can can do, uh, and and then roll that out uh, throughout the industry. And, you know, they're, they're very you know quite basic things, but but it's creating the the, the the time and space for the crews to come together. I mean, in, you know. I, I, I didn't go to sea, but I understand in the old days when alcohol was uh, allowed on board, where there were bars and you know people lingered after a meal and and, and talked to one another. Um, so it's how, how you kind of replicate that in in, in the modern environment. And and uh, I mean, so far we, we um, you know w w one one example where uh, the the crew have 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 because of the project have, have tried to kind of interact more where they've. Organised more more events, more coming together, and, and someone uh, like uh, an inspector went aboard the vessel and 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 recognised the you know the change in in the atmosphere is a much more positive thing. So we're in we're in the middle of the, of, of the project, and um, in about six months' time, we're we're, we're write it all up and and then disseminate the findings amongst the industry. But uh, some some of it sounds really straightforward and basic, but. But, but but a lot of it, it, it works, and and you know as I said, it's really important, you know, to bring people together. You know, we're social beings. Um, you know, we need that social interaction, uh, and you know, also that communication back home with friends and family. That's the number one, you know, welfare concern of, of seafarers when you talk to them. That they want that connectivity back back home with with with, with their family, and and friends, and, and that that that's uh, you know. Are really important, and again, as some of the previous panelists have said, particularly in the pandemic, with crews staying on board uh, longer, that that's becoming increasingly important. That that contact with back home. Mm. Yeah, I guess one of the issues on on ship, as I've never served on ship, is that you, you know you've got so many different cultures, nationalities, uh, you know, uh, experiences on board, and and, and that's probably bridging bridge, bridging that is a challenge. But you feel some of the initiatives that you've uh, you're sort of putting forward as good, uh, a good practice can help overcome some of those. Um... I think so. You know, it seems obvious about you know how, how you get that that team, the crew on board to, to bond to, to 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 work together, and and you know it's it's a safety issue um, um, as well. The the fact that people are working together and, and also being more productive, uh, and you know the, the, there are challenges with with, with different cultures on board, but but is that 
you know, again, it's that communication, um, you know, that the leadership on board is important and, that, and then giving, you know, the chief officers, the masters, the, the time and space to, to actually, you know, talk and, and get to know the crew. You know, we, we know there's loads of demands now on on the masters and officers in terms of reporting and everything else but it's actually having that that space to actually bring people together yeah that's good 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 ideas um now i'd like to come to dr yasser al wahedi at Abu Dhabi ports maritime academy a very important institution how, how are you responding to the need for um greater awareness amongst all levels of uh, of shipping from the, the the top to the bottom both at sea and ashore uh, of of seafarer uh, mental health issues and, and and are you offering any specific training courses now or, or training initiatives uh to to respond to this issue uh thank you thank you clive for this uh, wonderful question so uh, i would like to establish first of all what is the current approach that's usually followed in maritime academies and colleges which is standard so if we are talking about uh, high school graduates who are joining the cadetship uh, programs, usually they undergo three phases of uh, education. So phase one is just conventional university-based academic education where they experience uh, different courses. Now, during this phase, what we do actually, uh, we try to assess, first of all, their mental resilience. So we assess uh, how can they cope with uh, uh, basically with the education level, the education requirements. Uh, and the other thing that we are also trying to do also is to build up within them the mental resilience through the education program. The typical approach is very similar to the approach that we usually follow in normal universities. Now, the second phase, which is completely different and unique for the uh, seamanship uh, training, is the seagoing service phase, whereby they need to spend, according to IMO, uh, 12 months as a minimum. Uh, for deck officers, uh, I think uh, six months uh, to nine months for uh, marine engineers. So they have to spend this time in the sea. What we try to do uh, at that phase is try to make it gradual for the cadets. So instead in the beginning, let's say they will be serving at the shore, near the shore operations. And later on, they can go for uh, sea going, foregoing, foreign going basically ships. Uh, th through this gradual approach, what we try to do is we assess their mental resilience and we try to build it within them. Now, in terms of trainees and courses, going back to your uh, question, we are trying, uh, we are still, you know, working closely to develop a course which try to train, uh, first of all, different stages, different levels of people. So basically for training, we need to provide training for the administration level, for the management level. So ship management people who are working at homes or working on their uh, buildings, HQs and so on, they need, we need to uh, make them aware of the challenges the people on the sea are facing. And how do they can address or support the team at the sea uh, in addressing their uh, mental, uh, basically, problems, uh, uh, stress, and so on? Uh, also, we would like to address, uh, provide also training for the uh, sh the captains themselves, so the masters and chief mates. How can they handle the uh, mental issues that maybe their crew are facing? So we need to provide them at that level. The third level, which is also important, is to try to train the crews themselves. How can they cope with their mental problems? Uh, how can they be, first of all, transparent, be clear? They need to communicate these mental problems. And uh, how can they try themselves, even if you put under a situation where they only have to depend on themselves, how can they cope with them uh, using different approaches? So we are starting, you know, we are developing the program closely with Dr. Fahad. Uh, and uh, once the program is ready, inshallah, we'll try to integrate it within the standard academic program based for either for training. There will be another program, of course, for cadets. So uh, what kind of mental health they are going to experience? How do they can cope with them and so on? But these two sides of the coin, uh, training for the cadets and training for professionals, management or chief, chief mate, master mates and crews, uh, has to go hand in hand. And we're trying to develop these things and integrate them in our curriculum. Now, what the challenge we are facing, of course, uh, in order to integrate just the curriculum, you need to go through the accreditation process and you have to go through government, uh, you know, uh, authorities, competent authorities with respect to the IMO requirement and so on. And this is where we'll need the support. So some sort of lobbying with IMO or whatnot or government, you know, especially at the IMO level, whereby to highlight the importance of mental health uh, issues and how to address them in our curricula is needed. So lobbying at that level, I think, is needed. 
Okay. And one thing I was going to ask you, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm of a certain generation and I don't play computer or video games, but I know a lot of uh, younger people and I guess those uh, people on, on board uh, ship are, uh, are, are very used to that. I mean, are you using technology and techniques borrowed from the gaming industry to sort of make training more attractive and more engaging for uh, those who go through it? Now, there are aspects basically which is uh, relevant to the, the notion of gamification of training. Whereby, for instance, uh, uh, currently we are still developing the programs. I have seen some programs whereby, for instance, they will be providing some sort of uh, training courses, uh, quizzes, uh, gamified training aspects, where the the basically the crew members on the ship were trying to score points. So this aspect, whereby you know who can score more points, uh, will be basically either have like a tangible reward or only just the uh, you know the uh, the mental feedback, the feeling that you you know you score the best, I am the best, and so on. This kind of gamification of uh, training, gamification of uh, uh, basically the uh, training programs, the online tools, and so on, they can help a lot. Uh, we are trying to introduce them, of course, um, uh, but it takes time. As I said, you know, the, this issue aspect of lobbying. But I've seen some companies which they do that in their uh, in their competency management system. And also even sometimes in their entertainment system. So they might have some sort of games that are available for all the crews from all the ships to join together. Uh, maybe some events between different ships together, you know, through video games, uh, you can, these things can be done. And those can actually raise up the, uh, uh, the mental state of the whole ship as a team and also enhance the camaraderie between the uh, crews, crew members. Yeah. It's quite interesting thinking Roger's point about social interaction and, and yours training. It's good to bring the two things together. They're both vitally important. Um, I believe now we've got Reverend Andy Bowerman on the line. Can you hear me, Andy? Uh, Andy, I think you're, uh, you're, uh, your microphone says you're muted, but I don't know. Uh, you're listed as uh, being present, but I can't hear you. I'll, let you say, I'll, I'll move on to Dr. Farhad uh, Alabay, who's the, as I mentioned, was the medical advisor at Kuwait Oil Tanker Company. Um, I'm just wondering what, what, what you know, obviously you, 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 you're dealing with real problems. What, what, um, what issues have you seen an increase in and, and, and have you had any successes in how you've been dealing with them through new approaches or I don't know whether treatment is the right word, but you know, the, the sort of how, how you've addressed the issues. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, here in KOTC, we, we acknowledge that, that there is a problem and there is a mental health issue among seafarers. We acknowledge that seafaring is one of the toughest jobs in the world. And uh, again, the seafarer is part of the community. If we took the numbers, one of four uh, globally will suffer from mental illness and one of six uh, from the working population will suffer from mental illnesses and seafarers are no uh, difference from other population or the general population. So we acknowledge that we will face uh, mental health illnesses on board our vessels and, and our seafarers. Uh, I think the first step would be to, that, to acknowledge that we have a problem that we need to address and then we need to tack, tackle it from different angles. Uh, in KOTC, we run a cadetship program, a scholarship program, and during that uh, program, we assess uh, the person for his mental resilience and mental uh, ability, including his uh, health, mental health wellness. And then we try to prime them from the beginning and try to uh, explain to them what they are expected to face as a seafarer and their world in the, in the seafaring industry. Uh, as you know, many of the uh, research showed that we have maybe two peaks where people can suffer the most from seafarer or me uh, mental health illness and seafaring, where the cadet ship, where we have many of the drop-offs have in, in the cadet ship and the uh, early life of seafarer. And then the next peak will be when they are in the mid-40 and early 50. Uh, uh, and we are trying to tackle uh, these two peaks through our uh, medical examination process and uh, recruitment process. Uh, we run training programs and trying to uh, educate people regarding mental health uh, issues and try to speak up uh, when they ha have an issue. 
uh, same as uh, other companies, maybe we have also a 24 7 uh, lifeline and uh, uh, till kind of uh, communication with the head office regarding any uh, uh, mental health issue need to be uh, reported to us. So we are trying to tackle the issue from different angles, from the new joiners or the newcomers, existing people on board through uh, conducting the um, periodical medical examinations and uh, and, and case by case uh, situation. Uh, I would like to add that being an in-house medical officer uh, and working hand in hand with the crewing department and with the fleet personnel department also can shed a, a lots of light and can raise yellow flags for us in early uh, stages. Uh, so we can identify kind of a problematic case or an issue uh, early before the seafarer joining. We can sense uh, the, the way of communication, his preparedness for joining, um, the way that he's approaching the joining uh, procedure can give you an early indication that there is something can going. Some seafarer, when you, you try to arrange an appointment with them or a phone call and try to say, yeah, we just call them. Um, do you have any problem? Do you want to speak anything? Do you have any issue? Why are you delaying you joining? Why are you submitting too much sick leave? And then the issue then will be revealed and we will try to tackle it early on from the beginning rather than waiting him to join the vessel and then explore there. So uh, we developed kind of here a culture of openness between us, the medical advisor and all the uh, crewing uh, uh, the department and we can um, uh, discuss the cases in, in, uh, in kind of clear matter and try to avoid any un unnecessary joining. Uh, some of the success stories, yes, we have some success stories. I can mention some of them. Um, I, I remember one case uh, where we have some guy where we he's supposed to join and then he submitted a sick leave and then three days later he submitted another sick leave. Uh, when I review the sick leave, it doesn't make sense. The, the condition doesn't match and so I picked up the phone and I spoke to him. Uh, how are you doing? How are you doing? You are supposed to join in a few weeks. Um, is there any problem? Uh, you are submitting sick leave. Do you need more time for healing? Do we need to do more um, examination? We are more than welcome to uh, to help you and assist you with all the mitigation. And at the beginning he said, no, I'm okay. I'm, I will. I will be ready. Then the third sick leave came in and then we said, OK, we need to come and meet me. We sat and, and let's say unofficial of the record uh, meeting and then I told him, I'm here to help you. Tell me, how can I help you? Then we noticed that he's just been married and he's trying to get the, a baby with his wife, but he's under treatment and he's under the course of medication and required him to be in the house for three months. And he'd been stressed and he don't want to join during that period. And he'd been very stressed because this treatment costs a lot and he is unable to cope with the thing. So we, we, I told him, okay, that's a private thing. We will not disclose it to other people. We can work with the fleet personnel and the crewing department to find you someone, something else and to rearrange your uh, joining date to suit your, uh, your plans. And if it, you know, our crewing department was uh, very helpful in arranging him to training courses during that period and help him to get through the period that he required to uh, complete his treatment and uh, uh, eventually he joined without any problems. Uh, this is one of the stories. Other story we have during the pandemic, we have a very, very talented uh, newly promoted masters who uh, spent overdue on board the vessel and he missed the time to join his uh, family due to the lockdown and he ended up strangling here in Kuwait and unable to meet his uh, his family. Uh, he was very stressed and he disclosed it, uh, to me that I'm under stress, I need help. Um, we acknowledge the problem that we said, okay, you, you, you kind of having some stress. I, I would like you to see some of the therapists and to assess your condition and to put a plan for you how we can uh, get you back on board safely. 
And I think he went to the, we referred him to one of the uh, psychologists that we know, and he spent with him a few sessions. And we asked the crewing department here to uh, delay his joining and give him some uh, plan how, if he will join, to uh, sign off with uh, his family so he can join his family. And they were very helpful in arranging his needs and he meets his requirement. And hopefully it was, a, uh, and thankfully it was a very successful uh, approach from our side. Thanks, Dylan. Very interesting, Dr. Fahad. You know, one gets the impression, I'm not an, obviously an expert in, in these matters, but one gets an impression that the industry is moving more towards, uh, you know, or the profession, sorry, is moving more towards um, talking therapies and cognitive behavioural therapy and things like that, and away from the prescription of medication. Is that approach true of shipping industry as, as much as it is of land-based communities? And if so, on seafarers generally responding to the idea of CBT and other approaches? We have to acknowledge the problem. And uh, right now, I think we are in generation that they are accepting and acknowledging the, uh, the mental health problems. Uh, what we are facing, to be honest, is the industry is not acknowledging the problem and it's not trying to uh, change and move forward and deal with this. Uh, again, with because of the safety sensitive jobs and the, all the safety issue job, it is um, unwise and uh, unrecommended in the current time to have serving seafarers who are on medication on board before depression and other mental illnesses. Uh, mental illnesses, with, like, let's say, like stress, general anxiety disorders, and adjustment disorders, we can manage them without medication, and we can manage them in, 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 in uh, kind of cognitive behavior therapy and very well matter. But if it can reach and uh, you know and be compensating degree, then we have to refer them for uh, the psychologist and psychiatrist, where um, uh, medication can be impl implemented. When we go to that stage, it is very complicated and very uh, difficult to get them back to their uh, full capacity, functioning capacity, especially if they are in command position and senior uh, position. I'm not talking because of uh, the, the company itself, but it will, it will go to the insurance, it will go to other um, uh, kind of uh, regulating bodies. Uh, uh, it is very difficult and it is very uh, tough uh, subject to deal with. And now we are going with, let's say, globalization and we're seeing another, other uh, people getting into the industry and we, we should be prepared for, and let's say, the females and women getting in, in, in the industry. And we, may, we know that this uh, job is already difficult for males and men. And we, support, we, we acknowledge that it will be also difficult for female and women. And we have to have the, the procedures and uh, guidelines to prepare the industry to deal with this situation for uh, the, the seafarer, men or women, uh, equally. Um, so it is a very tricky situation. In the current time, we're dealing with it as a case-by-case situation. We do special risk assessment uh, for each case. Um, uh, and we try to board and join the seafarer uh, off medication, and we try to give them uh, the uh, you know required time to rearrange themselves, to develop the resilience, to go to all the coaching uh, uh, and training they need uh, to cope with the job stresses and to the separation and uh, the life. Uh, the stresses they face as a seafarers. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fahd. It's very interesting. I uh, learned some interesting facts there. Um, Andy Bowman, are you on, on the line and can you hear me? Uh, I am on the line and I can hear you. Good. Well, welcome, Andy, from uh, wherever you may be. Um, <laughs> you've missed an interesting discussion so far. Um, but I just wanted to pass out that the question I asked first of off of my uh, panelists was, you know, what has been the single biggest impact of the pandemic on seafarer, well, seafarer welfare? And I just wondered whether, what, what your view was that, what, what from your uh, perspective with the mission for seafarers, what, what has been the single biggest impact? Yeah, I think yeah. our seafarers happiness index, which we uh, run every quarter, 
uh, which highlight increased sense of isolation and disconnection. Uh, increased pressure in that I think there's a sense that whilst within the industry we may recognise our seafarers as key workers, there's a sense for many of them uh, that that's not reciprocated elsewhere. Um, so for, from our perspective, how you help people to, to deal with that sense of isolation and disorientation is a really important uh, factor to try and tackle. Okay. And, and what is initiatives has the Mission for Sea Repairers taken over the past year to tackle the problems that you've just mentioned and, and what impact do you feel they've had? Well, I think we have a couple of uh, uh, tools that we use, which I would call pre-departure or part of your training or preparation. Uh, so we run a program called the We Care Program, which really works with the seafarer and their family in trying to think through issues of communication, financial preparedness, but also begins to get them talking about their own emotional well-being. Um, and then when crews are on board, we, during the pandemic, have initiated the Chat to a Chaplain scheme, uh, which allows a seafarer anywhere with some limited amount of uh, connectivity to communicate with a chaplain uh, all around the world. And that's enabled us to respond really rapidly um, to some of the issues that seafarers are telling us about. And, and they're all the issues I'm sure you've already discussed that I missed whilst my own power here went off and I for a brief time experienced the life of a seafarer. And I'm sure you've talked about those, those feelings of isolation, of disorientation, particularly I think during the pandemic, they're feeling very disconnected from what may be happening in their own home country. So preparing them before departure, either that's with cadet training or preparedness before boarding, I would absolutely recommend some of the stuff we do with our We Care training program. When they're on board, then there are opportunities for them to chat with a chaplain. Um, as long as, and I, again, people may have already covered this, but as long as there is this, I guess, two key factors. One is that there is a, a sort of open, safe space created, but also that within the company, there's a culture which doesn't stigmatize mental health. Um, way back when I was training as a psychologist, we learned uh, from a guy called Irving Goffman that uh, they used to describe mental health as spoiled identity. And we need to find a way of redescribing mental health, that it's, that it's not some sort of spoiled identity, it's just a normal part of who we are as people. It is another one of the health factors that we have to take into consideration when we're assessing you know, the suitability and the well-being of a seafarer. I think that's, uh, that's a good point. I think we will become perhaps a bit more aware of uh, mental health and, and, and just generally by, by talking about it. Um, uh, do, you, do you still see that there are some shipping companies who have a very antiquated view to mental health or do you think, generally speaking, the majority of shipping companies are now, you know, coming on board with the idea that this is a genuine issue that they need to be focusing on? So my sense would be, I think the latter is true, true within the sector, that more companies are trying to make themselves aware and their staff aware. I still think we've got a few steps to take to make sure that we've really got that kind of destigmatization de de of mental health, that, that seafarers themselves feel open to be able to talk about the issues they're facing. I just caught the end of your last panelist. Uh, talking about um, the seafarer who, who took a long time to be able to find that ability to share you know, the pressure that was actually causing him to be disoriented or disconnected from from his family. So I think we're we're in that mid plate somewhere where more and more companies are becoming aware. I mean, I, I'm asked more and more often to talk about their well-being, seafarer mental health, but now we've got to make sure that we're properly equipped that we're using the tools that have been developed by ourselves and other organizations to really help seafarers build that kind of resilience that they need, but also that they feel there is this safe space, this place where they can come and share not just their physical health needs, but those emotional and mental health needs as well. Okay. And one final point, Andy, just in case we leave, lose you, uh, I hope we don't. Um, what would be your message to government? I mean, you've, you've sort of said that, you know, about there's obviously the important role that, that shipping companies play in, in, in getting get seafarers to talk about their problems and so on. What, what, what would your message be to governments uh, in, in terms of tackling this growing problem? It's interesting. I, I see now in the last six months, there is this real awareness that seafarers are vital. So there is a moment as an industry, industry to be able to take hold of that uh, raised awareness 
and, and use it to kind of broaden the depth of our training, if you like. Um, I'd want governments to, to talk a lot more openly about a, a whole range of issues that seafarers face, that, that when you pass your medical, it isn't just, well, you appear to be physically fit, but we actually allow seafarers to express all those other health issues that can affect us. Um, but but I, I sense it, it's, a, it's a tipping point moment, really, for the industry and for governments. So I, I'd like to think the government might focus, yes, on all the other health and safety that needs to happen, but let's not forget that the key component of all of that health and safety is the seafarer. So let's turn our focus again to the seafarer and make sure that our training is adequate, that our training goes deep enough, and that, as I say, we, we begin to shift our conversations about mental health into it being just another health condition that, that we all face and we all have to find ways to deal with. Yeah. I think that's true. I think it is an issue we all face. And I think we start from that basis that it's not something that happens to other people. It, ha it happens to us all, don't we? And I think it's something uh, that, that we all need to be honest about. Um, Absolutely. Before we, yeah, before we break for uh, uh, the commercial breaks, I just want to come back to our panellists in case there was any anything they'd heard they wanted to come back on before we break. Um, Chris, was there anything you've heard that you wanted to perhaps uh, respond to? <coughs> yeah, I'd go back. Um... So when Roger was speaking and he was talking about um, the programmes on board ships for seafarers um, to basically be together. I mean, this is something uh, Ali and myself, I think, fully three, four years ago in uh, locked rooms were discussing internet on board ships. And I think my view has changed on this because I wanted to ban it in the cabins um, to try and have it in the communal areas only, simply because people were going back to their cabins or still are now and then they're going on Facebook, social media. They're looking at issues. Before when seafarers went to sea, they basically didn't know what was going on at home, apart from the odd phone call for uh, the term of their contract. Now they get to hear that uh, the daughter's sick, uh, the wife is gonna divorce them, all of these issues. They come up on social media and then that creates mental stress. So we had discussions probably three, four years ago about whether internet is actually bad for ships but the fact is it is progression uh, communication is required and if you don't have internet on ships you won't get seafarers because it's pretty much a demand so again we then started discussing other things that people were doing now one of the captains uh, not one of ours but i think it was one of ali's they came up with a novel idea of they just downloaded um, all of the latest uh, netflix um, series and then basically the captain implemented a system on the ship where one or two episodes were played at certain times um, so that the whole crew was up to date on a particular series. They all agreed on which ones were gonna be watched. And then the whole crew had something to talk about because they were all watching it slightly different times, but in groups. And that was a good initiative just by a captain to put something on board and promote um, sort of the community together. Um, so yeah, just coming back, I think what Roger's doing with this one is very good. And I think that uh, more ideas that can be put out there for um, interaction to help crew members and also training of certain crew members to spot if one of their colleagues has a problem. That would be extremely beneficial. So I think it's <clears throat> if we're in an office um, and you've got stress about something, you go home, you speak to your wife or you speak to friends, you can do that. If you're on a ship, you can't. You have to rely on your work colleagues to become your friends and do that for you. I think if there could be some training, which I think is happening in many companies now, for people to spot whether one of the colleagues has an issue. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of companies have mental first aiders as well as physical first aiders now on, on the land. I mean, I don't know whether a similar system applies or, uh, at sea, but certainly I think for those companies that I deal with that, that have, a have, have trained certain members of staff to be mental first aiders, I think it's had a, a positive impact. Um, Ali, Ali Shihab, is there anything you've heard that you want to reflect back on? Oh, uh, this discussion is so good that it's all food for thought. I mean, you know, basically what we are, we are, we are people who are passionate for what we do. And, you know, systematically, when, when you are passionate about something, you become, you know, creative. Now, it's all about knowing. Knowing leads into uh, what we call awakening. And then the awakening leads into awakening doing. That's the a, that's a stages of how we as people work with things, yeah? Now, just want to share with you some, some, some thoughts based of 
on, on, on what's been discussed here. And it's all about weak signals. And I, I, I refer here to uh, this uh, interactive programs that uh, uh, Shell is doing. These are, you know, it's one of the unique without undermining anybody else in the industry. But uh, th thanks to Chris, you mentioned PNI Club before, and they join forces with Shell, and then they have this uh, uh, interactive uh, training programs. You can go on their on their website, and there's fantastic just you know uh, training and interactive active program where it deals with mental issues, training needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we focus on the weak signals, that's where the manifestation happens. That's where you know, we need to focus on this with great attention, weak signals. So I go back into that incident of the Wakashio back in 18th December, 2020. And look at that incident, which happened off the coast of Mauritius. So the, the, the captain broke all the law of safety and took the ship close to the shore side to get a mobile signal in, at, in, in, in aim to get that crew whose birthday was then or some, some event which was related to a person. That's from his personal, you know, from his responsibility towards his team. He brought the ship close to the shore side and it ran aground to get a, a signal. You, if you go to Reuters and, and you find that report, what they've written, about what led into that incident. Basically, the title is caused by lack of attention to safety. And, and basically, that's where it's, it's, it all starts from. And then, you know, if you look at, since the time we've, we posted the invites for this webinar until today, 4th of April, Bangladesh, we had 27 dead on a capsized uh, a passenger ship and then on the 5th in China there was a fishing boat 12 dead and uh, 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 also believe it or not in Suez Canal we have two Aframaxes run aground yesterday or let's say it's sort of slightly grounded you know after the ever given incident and then you know when you put all these things these, together or these incidents together, these basically are weak signals to tell you that there is something out there which needs our uh, attention. If you are going to ask me what is, what do you feel, uh, you know, life on board is, uh, is the situation like what was uh, explained just before, I mean, by, uh, uh, by our colleague, we lost him now, not, not Andy. Uh, the other gentleman. Basically, the best definition of uh, life on board or a person sailing on board ship is the, 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 the social, social distancing. I have a gap of being able to communicate with my family, with my friends, with my colleagues, but you as a company, you as an operator, we as an industry, if we provide that communication mean, needs, you know, the knowing, awakening, awakening, doing, people will get relaxed they will stop worrying about what's happening back home, especially in the pandemic uh, time. And, uh, you know, it takes me back in years ago when we were sailing on board and listening to the BBC, to the football match results, Leeds, one, <laughs> Liverpool, two. And then, we, you know, I, I remember my father-in-law, James Witherspoon, before, he, he used to write them down, obviously, for the... For, for, for the matches, you know, then for, uh, for the whatever things that he was doing. But this is no longer the, those days. This is the day of technology. This is the day of digital communication. This is the day where, or, or where we, we as a community, as an industry, we can enable ourselves to get over this uh, mental health issues and difficulties that people are, are facing. And then I put my hand into what was what was said before, mental health is normal. It's like having high blood pressure, hypertension, you know, uh, cold or something. But we need to recognize it correctly within the system. There is too much to say, but I stop here.
That's fine. Thank you very much, Ali. And uh, before I break for a, a commercial, Roger, I haven't, you haven't had a chance to come back. Do you want to reflect on what you've heard so far? And is there anything you want to highlight in particular? Just, just very briefly. I, I mean, I, I think one of the things we talked about earlier about seafarers not being a priority, and you know, if you look at uh, what happened to the Ever Given in the Suez Canal, it was front page news, and you know, we're being phoned by CNN, BBC, so a, a lot of other people. And, you know, if shipping was to stop for a week and people didn't get their Nikes and iPhones, then maybe seafarers would become a priority. But I, I think, you know, we need to build on that unfortunate incident and, and, and show to the world, you know, the importance of seafarers, that they live hidden lives. Um, shipping is hidden. Uh, you know, we're, the ports are cut off now from the sense of the population. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more needs to be done. But, um, you know, I think, you know, we need to get out to the world, you know, that, that seafarers that play a key role in our everyday lives. Well, thank you very much, Roy. Thank you very much for this very, uh, you know, uh, illuminating conversation that we've had so far. We'll continue after the commercial break when I will be putting some questions that raised by people as they've been registering or while we've been online um, across the, uh, you know, the, across across the audience base. So we're going to just have a, a brief uh, commercial interlude which will last for about four or five minutes when messages from our sponsors stay where you are don't go anywhere and we'll be back um, within a very short space of time the winds of change shape the course of our industry the waves are unpredictable but we ride them towards promising shores when we come together and move in one direction. We challenge the headwinds and anchor our place in the future. We turn the tide. We steer ahead. We stand out and we won't stop there. Because what matters most is the impact of our achievements impact that pushes us and inspires us to go beyond. We are Abu Dhabi Ports. We are united in our vision.
even at our most prepared, danger is inevitable when we are floating into the belly of the beast. At Islamic p and Club, we make sure you evade even the inevitable. Fly with us over the tides. Welcome back. I, I think most of you have come back. Uh, uh, hopefully you're you're there. Um, I, I know if I've got Ray Deeks on the line. Can you hear us now, Ray? Ray, are you there? I think Ray is still um, uh, still having problems. Well, welcome back, um, uh, and thank you to our sponsors that we've just heard from. Um, I've had, I've had a number of questions are coming online while we've been uh, watching those, and one from Hemant Varma to all panellists, um, I suppose relates in a way to the fact that the physical well-being of, of, of crew and their protection interacts with their mental health. But uh, the question is, how is the industry dealing with the requirements of vaccination of ship's crew? Which I'm sure is a very complicated and, uh, and complex issue. I'm, I'm going to start with Roger. I'm, I think Iswan has been doing some work on, on guiding uh, the industry around the vaccination process. So perhaps I'll come to you first. Uh, do, do, do you have a, a perspective on, on how the, the vaccination process should be managed for ship's crew? Um, I, I think it, it's, uh, there's a real problem here. I mean, um, we, we've been part of a group um, working together. Um, I, mean, I mean, one of the positive things of, of, of the pandemic has been the fact that you know, all different sectors of the industries come together, the, the ship owners, the unions, IMO, ILO, welfare organisations, uh, etc. And we've been part of a group that's been meeting regularly with, with, with the International Chamber of Shipping, the ITF uh, and, and a number of other, other organisations. And they've had a uh, vaccine task force that has produced a couple of uh, documents um, including some um, guidelines for seafarers. But I, I think the biggest issue is access to, to vaccines um, by, by seafarers. And it, as you know, some panelists have talked about, about seafarers being key workers in a, in a number of countries that have been designated, but, but they're, they're still down, you know, um, down the queue as it were. Um, there are a lot of key workers being designated. So, so I, think, I think it's an issue, you know, vaccine hesitancy has been talked about, but I, I, think, I think the real thing at the moment is that seafarers want to get vaccinated. Uh, we, 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 we hear talk about vaccine passports and if seafarers aren't going to get, get vaccinated or if it's going to be very slow then there's going to be a real problem with crew changes and seafarers being able to get to or from the vessels and if you look at the vaccination rates in some of the key supply labor supply countries like india i think it's only five percent of the population has been vaccinated so far in in, in the philippines it, it, it's even less than that i think it's only 0.75 percent so we see for us coming from those, those countries, for instance, it, I think it's going to be a real, real issue. So there needs to be more of an effort. And I, I know at the various levels at the IMO, ILO, um, this has been talked about, about trying to get um, seafarers um, um, access to the vaccines. And there's talk about hubs being set up. So, so I think our concern is really pushing for, for that access. And, you know, uh, there isn't a simple solution. I think there's more vaccines coming online, um, but, but I think it's going to be a time before more seafarers are vaccinated and more pressure needs to put, be put on governments to ensure that, that seafarers are, are, are pushed up the queue. Okay, thank you, Roger. And Dr Farhad, I mean, obviously you're at the sharp end and I suppose you're having to sort of formulate policies and strategies. How, how, how do you see the situation at the moment and, and what needs to be done? Are you on mute, uh, Dr. Farhad? Hello? I think we're better now, yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right now, we are also planning for vaccinating our seafarers. And um, in here in Kuwait, seafarers are being designated as essential workers. Uh, but the problem right now is the logistics. Uh, attached to that vaccination. It depends on what vaccine is available in the country and 
and how you've been administrated. If you get the visor, you are okay, but you have to uh, schedule it within the leave of the seafarer so he can get the both shots within the leave and before he joins. If you are assigned for uh, Oxford or AstraZeneca, that's it. Right now, the, the, you know, the gap is up to three months, which gives us a problem for vaccinating the second dose. Uh, for people outside Kuwait, uh, it is very difficult to, uh, you know, promote their vaccination or control their vaccination because it's run by their government and their, their state. Uh, we are trying now to push uh, toward, you know, promoting and prioritizing the vaccination for all seafarers. And uh, we are hoping that we can uh, get into uh, it as soon as possible. But there are many logistical and uh, operational, uh, let's see, the, the has uh, hard goals before we accomplish this program. Okay. Uh, and Chris, there was a, another question which was, will seafarers need COVID passports in future? I suppose the question really is, you know, are shipping companies like eShips going to be saying to seafarers, you must be vaccinated to be on our ships? Uh, and if so, how can that be managed? I don't know if it's a case of must be vaccinated. Um, I mean, we we offered for we have a coast in addition to the ocean going fleet, we have um, a coastal fleet which um, several of the vessels are under UAE flag and it's based uh, and they're based in Pujaira. Uh We offered um, all of the crew uh, onshore um, vaccinations in Pujaira and uh, we had a hundred percent take up rate. I think the crew themselves want to be vaccinated. I mean, most of our office staff have been vaccinated. In fact, the only ones that haven't are ones that have actually had COVID and they can't have it yet. So I think for us, um, offering vaccination where possible, but the biggest problem is it's getting mass vaccinations out to the um, ocean going fleet. And this is something we have been lobbying with um, various governments or trying to lobby with various governments. So, I mean, as um, Roger said, with India, I mean, the the percentage is extremely tiny and they're currently one of the biggest manufacturers and getting seafarers who are currently ashore designated as key workers so they can go and get vaccinated um, should be a priority. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people agree with that. Now I've got Andy Bowerman. Can you hear me, Andy? Because you were saying you couldn't hear us to start with. Can you hear us now? We might have a problem. Maybe somebody might be able. The back office might be able to try and connect with Andy. Um, Ray Deep, I are can you... hear you. I... Oh, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, oh you're back. Right. Um, and Ray, are you with us now? Oh yes, I'm having technical problems. Oh, uh, well, unfortunately, it just the, the the application closes after some time. I oh, know. Well, look, okay, I'll give you. Uh, uh, well, while you've got the mic, I'll yeah. I'll, I'll give you a just. I mean, uh, welcome, Ray. Um, yeah. So you 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 set up your Ray of Light. Um, a project. Uh, uh, perhaps you'd yes. like to tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what impact or, or, and what sort of reception it's been uh, given so far. Well, I, I launched a Ray of Light coaching services in February last year, just before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's just uh, a service, it's a stress management for peak performance, health and well being, online coaching programs and workshops for businesses, organizations, and individuals. But you know, after the pandemic, of course, I had to take another look to my business uh, and a colleague of mine recommended me to maybe uh, approach to the maritime industry because I have a background also in the maritime industry for many years and I understand the problems that seafarers are facing and now with the pandemic that is even worse. So I've been uh, trying to now uh, to introduce my services to the maritime um, sector to see if I can help because uh, I understand the uh, magnitude of the problem uh, at the moment. That is a problem that has been there just before the pandemic, but now it's, it's even worse now with these limitations uh, with the crew change. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been going well. Uh, I've been working more with individuals and the, with businesses, but I would like to have more opportunities maybe to help businesses to implement wellness programs uh, to give their employees the resources they need to perform at the best. Mm. And, and and when you look at your experiences and in, in, in the industry and, and what, what 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 needs to happen to do more to assist in resolving mental health issues on board? What 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 sort of different approaches do you think uh, the industry needs to embrace? Oh, 
I think we may have lost lost him again. Um, okay. Um, uh, there's a question here for um, Dr. Yasser, I think, to start with, and it's from uh, Sarab Kanchan. And it says, no amount of onshore training gives a taste of life at sea. Um, mental health of seafarers is, is something that requires regular monitoring. You know, are there any proposals to arrange for regular assessment of seafarers at sea? Um, and, and I don't know, what, do, do, do institutions like yours have a role to play in that, do you think? Oh, it's, uh, so one of the aspects that we are trying to engage at Abu Dhabi Maritime Academy is to establish this notion of competency management system. So in a competency management system right now, the standard is that it is completely managed by the ship management company itself. What we want to do is to start introducing the academy. So the academy will be a partner with the ship management system, whereby our experts will be able to provide some training courses, uh, uh, do some uh, scenarios, simulator scenarios, assessment right now. There is a potential for offering a simulator training over the cloud. So we just need, you know, a flat screen. Through simulator training over the cloud, we can uh, let the trainee, the crews actually undergo uh, different scenarios whereby we can assess their ability to cope with stress, uh, ability to cope with emergencies and so on. So through this competency management system, through cloud uh, simulator training and through this design of simulator uh, scenarios whereby through the scenario we assess their ability to address the stress uh, in, in a gamified way. Uh, all of these things I think can contribute to uh, first of all providing continuous assessment of the cruise, cruise ships. Uh, let them run under a scenario whereby there is nothing to lose so basically they can also uh, Exp uh, let's say express themselves in a much more open way, uh, take actions that might be, you know, risky uh, under a cloud a simulator, you are not losing anything. And at the same time, provide all of this valuable information to us as an academy whereby we can integrate it and incorporate it in our tailor-made training programs for ship management companies and to the ship management company themselves. So uh, through training, I think through cloud-based simulator training also, we can address, uh, we can contribute to these issues. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yasser. Um, a question here coming from a gentleman or lady, I hope it's a gentleman called Chris Partridge. Um, isn't half the problem that crews have been paired back so far that at the end of a shift, there is no time for socialising. Socializing. The days of chats in mess rooms is past. Now you work, sleep, work. Um, maybe, Roger, I'll come to you first. I mean, do you... Do you feel that crews are one of the problems is that crews are too small now have been cut back to the fact that there's no sort of resilience in the in the system to to allow for meaningful inter, you know, mentally healthy interaction? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think this is this is a real problem. You know, it, it is the small crews and, and, and is is the fatigue, as Chris said, you know, um, that the people um, you know, working around the clock and, and, and with the kind of watch system and everything. And, and I think it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not safe to have people, you know, sort of uh, completely fatigued, um, you know, in charge of an expensive, uh, you know, really big uh, piece of kit. And, and, I, I, and I think, I mean, it's not an easy solution. I, I mean, you know, obviously one solution is to Ensure that there are the you know the more crew on board, um, and I, I know that's not necessarily a popular thing to, to you know to say because it's a it's a cost issue, um, but by, I think this does need to need to be looked at you know about the the future of uh, of seafaring and, and you know attracting people in in the industry if they're going to be um, sort of work to the ground, um, um, you know it, it, it's a, it's a it's a real problem. But I, I I think I think you know there's been lots of studies done on fatigue. You know, everyone knows it's an issue. Um, people know that um, people don't necessarily report their work and rest hours correctly. Um, and, uh, and I think until that's done, and, and to, you know, the scale of the issue is actually seen, um, that then um, you know, not a lot's going to be done. So, so I think I think this has to be really looked at um, uh, going forward. As I said before, it's about how you create that space and, and time to to socialise. And, and as I said before, it's about you know, you know how you get a productive crew, a crew that that, that is happy, and a crew that, that you know wants to be there and, and is engaged in, in in what they do and have a pride in what they do. Um, so I, I think this is uh, something that needs to be looked at going forward. 
Yeah, Ali Shihab, would you do you think the day will come when ship owners perhaps need to think, well, I've got 26 people on board a ship, I need to increase that to 28, 29, purely to protect the mental well-being of seafarers, or do you think money will come out on top all the time? It's, it's an arrow going the other direction, but I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think the that the the number of crew is reducing on board ships because uh, this is managed by the uh, by law where you have you know minimum safe manning and then you have the uh, work and rest hours sheets so for doing a certain task you know you have to comply with all those requirements so that you don't break the law nevertheless and it's all about the culture and the company how you run the business. Do you know the business well? The answer, of course, yes, we know the business very well. Now, you run it passionately. And how do you do that? I'll tell you. Like before, yes, I mean, there is no way or means of, uh, you know, escaping, um, except, you know, be there in the officer's lounge and uh, be there for the dinner or for lunch together and you sit there and then, you know, you sort of, you communicate and get updated. However, nowadays you even have way much better than what you do in the past. Now, I remember when we were sailing, I got a phone call when I was in the engine room, and then they tell me, come, come, Gazel Kuwait is passing uh, next to us. Maybe I was on Gazel Ahmadi or something. And then we come up and then we talk about the VHF and then we say, how are you doing? How is this and how is that? Or maybe we have three or four ships in the region and then we talk to each other through the VHF and then everybody's listening. Now, can you imagine I'm sitting here in my office and I'll create a quiz and I'll have it with all the fleet and I'll create a time or maybe with all the fleet but in different zones because of the timing where everybody is, people sleeping, people working. But you can create competitions, you can create quizzes, you can have a monetary as well, you know, sort of rewards for all of that. And then you keep that alive. Again, how do you do things in your company, in your organization, i.e. culture? You have to be creative and you have to work with the development that's happening. What I mean here again, and I repeat it, you have more tools than ever done before. So that guy who's sitting in the cabin or sitting in the bridge using the internet, and doing whatever he is doing, actually the system enables you to track every movement and then you can regulate it, you can develop it and you can get statistics. So again, you know, having the equipment on board, creating the facility on board is one thing. And then how do you really take it to the maximum potential like your smartphone or your smart device that you have? You know, you know, when person becomes so good in using that, tool or that device, actually you become so creative that the functions that you have on that device is no longer useful for you. And what will happen here, you develop further and you need more, you become more hungry for further solutions. And that's what the industry is actually lacking at the moment. Thinking that you focus on people on board is, what, uh, is the only problem, no. Focusing on the people in the office is, a, is another problem. The people who are running the fleet, those guys you need actually to have also a mental health uh, monitoring for them, i.e. can they take the load? Can they, do they have any kind of a training for, you know, sort of emotional intelligence of how to receive a complaint from the ship or from an individual and how to deal with them? On and on and on. So, the tra you know, you need to, develop that culture that copes with the digitalized uh, the digital development that we are facing uh, uh, in, within the industry that, that that's uh, that's my point of view here i've got a lot to say but <laughs> that's all right no no it's good um um uh, andy bowerman um a question that's sort of come in it, it relates to you know, on the list of priorities for the missions for seafarers right now where would you say mental health is you know is it is it your number one priority would you think when you're when you're you know developing the strategies that that the mission um you know to to, to, to deal with your uh, to deal with seafarers in the various ports around the world that you operate yeah that's a good question 
I mean, since our founding, we have always been about, I guess, what we would now call creating environments that allow for people to flourish. You know, that's that's our very reason for being. We want to ensure that seafarers, wherever they are, wherever they come from, have an environment which allows them to flourish. That That is our priority. Uh, we recognize that seafarers often live difficult lives. They live isolated lives. They live, I think, as Roger said, quite hidden lives often. But how can we keep ensuring with all of the sort of going on? And I would just, you know, just push a little back to Ali. But with all of the developments that are going on, we still have to make sure that the environment that our seafarers are in is allowing them to flourish. Um, so it is fantastic that seafarers now can communicate from all sorts of places to all sorts of places. And that has a lot of benefits, but we still have to help seafarers and help companies develop cultures, which are still about how do we allow all people within our company to flourish? Um, and I think sometimes all of the technological developments have impacted the ability for example, as that question before from Chris came in, the, the ability for crews to become a team, to become for the, the period of time that they're sailing an extended family where they do uh, mutually support one another, where they do understand about empathetic listening with one another, that, that there's new skills that seafarers need to learn, partly because of the increased digitization that we see going on around the world. But from our very inception, gosh, 160 odd years ago, we've always been about how do we enable seafarers to continue to flourish in the often difficult circumstances of their lives? And is it your perception that at the moment, a lot of them are not flourishing, that they are, that they are struggling more than well, they were before? Or is it? Is it a, 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 of course they are. I mean, look, look, look at any any crew member and Chris's point again, you know, getting shore leave at the moment is still almost impossible. So therefore you are constantly uh, on the move, particularly if you're in any, any sort of traveling, any sort of distance, there's no time to just rest. You know, the, the time in port has decreased and decreased and decreased. Therefore there's no time to, to just rest and be together. So I, I think crews are being squeezed more and more. And I, my sense is the pandemic has highlighted that. And that's why I was saying earlier, I think we have a moment in time where we need to take a step or two back and just consider again, the, the bigger picture of the direction that we're going in as, a, as a, um, an industry. And how do we ensure that, that the seafarer who is at the heart of an opportunity for themselves to develop and to flourish? Okay, thank you very much, Ali. And I'll, this links on a bit to the next question, um, which I'll put to Chris, because I know it's something he's uh, had thoughts on in the past, which was, you know, is enough thought given to the problems of seafarers at home not able to join ships as much as the people who are on ship not able to leave? I mean, uh, is, is it something that you think the industry generally, I mean, I know it's e-ships is something that you're thinking about, but is, the, is it the industry needs to step up and focus a little bit more on those who are at home as well as those who are on the ship? Yeah, I think it's a forgotten topic, actually. Um, I think we had um, situations where we had a captain call in um, saying, uh, can you put me on a ship? I'll go as a chief officer, I'll go as anything. Um, I need to get back to work and I need to earn some money. And I think that mm -hmm. everyone during the pandemic was completely focused on the seafarers stuck at sea. Um, but the way the industry works with seafarers not really being paid um, generally when they're not working, then uh, there was many that started getting into financial difficulties. So yeah, it's something, I mean, it's the reverse problem. Um, the seafarers that were stuck at sea, we obviously focused on and we ourselves, we gave um, increased uh, salaries for the overdue periods and things like that. We also offered people to come off at the next port and stay in hotels until they're in a position to fly back to where they should be. But yeah, the seafarers that were stuck at home it's not really it's not an issue that has been talked about often i've raised it on a few se seminars but um i don't think it's really been taken up anyway okay uh, i don't know anybody else um, uh, andy i mean perhaps for your thought i mean obviously the bishop of seafarers is very much focused on 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 the ship to shore interface i mean are, are you able to reach out to people who are still at home in, in land as it were i was just i was just having a question or attempting to in the chat box there and that we have been, and we've been doing some very practical things, distributing food and materials and resources to 
well over a thousand families uh, in the south of India. We've been trying to support seafarers who are looking to even retrain or, or change direction because they can't rejoin a ship. I mean, one of the beauties, of course, when you're a global organization is that you have people in so many different locations and places, and they are all responding to the pandemic and the current issues that they're seeing in ways that are appropriate to the culture and the context where they find themselves. So certainly across, for instance, India, uh, across the Philippines, we are seeing ourselves supporting seafarers who've been unable to sign back on. Okay, I don't know if anybody else has got any. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Yasser, um, training, I mean, is it, I suppose, something that people can do while they're at home waiting to join a ship is to sort of step up their training. Is that something you're thinking about more about how you reach out to, to um, those who are not able to join a ship, but give them the opportunity to fill that time constructively? And yes, I think this is a very quite uh, important point that you are raising, Clive. The aspect of training and how can we uh, communicate with those who are still waiting at the shore, waiting for their turn to come in and uh, join ships. So uh, again, uh, basically in the academy, we're trying to start up this competency management system, whereby the academy will become partner with the ship management companies and through the competency management systems, the crews themselves they can uh, basically log in into the program, the platform, and through the platform we can provide through it basically specific trainings. Uh, to the crew members while they are at their homes. So uh, using technology, using uh, uh, cloud-based, you know, uh, also simulator uh, training through the cloud, uh, using, of course, remote lecturing, uh, competency management systems, all of these technologies at hand, we are able to reach the crews while they are at their homes so that they can take their training. Now, uh, this is from the academy side, but also from the ship management side, would they consider this to be work or not? And will they compensate financially the crew members who are taking training, which is sometimes required? So it's either required training by uh, whatever regulator. Uh, will they compensate them financially for that? So uh, uh, doing this somehow might, you know, it's, uh, this is a question, of course, I'm throwing to the ship management companies. But I think if they can manage to do this, this might alleviate a little bit uh, the financial stress. Uh, on the uh, uh, seafarers who are still, uh, you know, at home, they're they're waiting eagerly to join uh, any ship and so on. Good, uh, Ali, you you wish to perhaps come back on the on the point that Dr. Yasser has made. Um, you you're taking me back with this question uh, back in 2007 when I was a manager for fleet personnel, uh, and we have the subject of training. You know, training and training and training. But we brought in at that time something different, and we call training and learning. And that's basically is the education. And that's where we started to work with the uh, uh, solution providers, where we came into this CBTs, computer-based trainings. And then we fed in uh, uh, the education uh, 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 part uh, of more of a, uh, uh, not just training, but is more of a learning. But then we developed into further like either to provide for the seafarers uh, a, a greater uh, uh, platform to work with for pursuing higher education. And then we had two means of doing that, on board or ashore. So then we went into the academies and we try to find a way of, let's say if somebody is ashore, he's on his leave, and then he goes through an education program, a diploma of some sort, or perhaps pursuing a further, you know, a higher degree of some kind. And then, you know, uh, uh, that can be also possible uh, 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 on board the ship, providing that you have uh, a, an internet uh, facilities. And then that was really the, the aim behind, uh, back in 2004 when we were putting the specification is to get that ship shore connectivity to the maximum possible uh, that we can, so that we can provide all that kind of solution to get, you know, the 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 the, the virtual ship information about the ship and the information about the people. And can you imagine if you have like as much as we are talking about the 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 uh, virtual vessel and you have the virtual person as well and get all his information and data. Yeah. Now that will require you know a real pulse or real time pulse check of the people that are on board. And then we brought something new at that time. 
And what we bought, we did, we did train the trainer. We selected five to six people who we trained and certified, and they, they became the trainers who go on board the ship. Basically, we are working with the regulation that mandates for us as a tanker operator at the time. Mandate on us is for us to conduct officer seminars on the shore, uh, officer seminar uh, on shore, officer seminar on board. And then that's where we thought, well, we can bring trainers and those onboard okay. trainers, they will go from one ship to another, deliver training, but at the same time, give us a real pulse of what's happening on board. How is the culture over there? How those people are doing and what's their needs? So it's like kind of 007 under, you know, undercover. And he does multiple jobs at the same time, give you a lot of information and deliver a lot of information that fits in within the, you know, your, 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 your uh, vision and direction as a company. That's what I wanted to follow on what Dr. Yasser was saying. Okay, thank you very much, Ali. Um, perhaps linked a bit to the, the conversation we've been having now is it uh, comes to Dr. Farhad. And the question is, what advice do you give to seafarers to stay positive when the future is uncertain, especially regard to sign off? And perhaps we can add to that question, you know, what, what do you give to uh, uh, seafarers to stay positive when it's when, when they're looking to sign on? Um, uh, what advice do you give? I mean, it must be conversations you have on a regular basis. Uh, what, what, what's your main advice to stay positive? I think you'll need to put yourself off mute again. Yeah, usually we start with finding the seafarer that we are in pandemic right now and uh, joining and leaving the vessel has to go through special procedures. We have a special procedure for joining and leaving and we expect every seafarer to follow through uh, these procedures. And by that time, we are following them. Uh, actually, we start following them uh, one month prior joining, and uh, we give them all the instructions regarding quarantine and the testing required for joining. And then, when the time is uh, due for the joining, we always mention that we are trying our best to get you out of the vessel on sign off and the uh, assigned date, but the availability of ports and uh, accessibility to flight will vary depending on the ship location. And uh, our fleet personnel uh, department or the crewing uh, department, they are doing their best, uh, trying to accommodate uh, people uh, uh, requests and uh, the timeline. But uh, usually there will be some hurdles and there's be some problems signing off and by finding them before they join that you might have a problem keeping you in mind that you will might have a delay uh, this can give them a little bit of resilience and uh, the below uh, reduce their expectation of the signing date and the conformity of the signing date and give them you know a kind of uh, mental preparedness that okay my uh, tour of duty might extend for a week or two depending on the availability uh, the main factor that we use is uh, we always in direct contact with the seafarers. We established, um, to be honest here, a, a personal relationship between us and the seafarers, and we communicate on personal levels. And that also can alleviate some of the stress related for the joining and the signing off. And uh, the, 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 sea, the seafarer and the crew can contact any one of us um, uh, at any given time, and we can apply for his request or for his question uh, regarding whether the safety of his journey, joining in or joining out, uh, signing off, or the prosperity or the future of his employment. We try to retain as much as possible seafarers we have. So the, the issue of retaining the seafarer is, uh, is kind of stable and they know that they are not subject to firing or to dismissal. Uh, it's just a matter when to find a vessel to put them in that suits their position and location. Um, the other way is also tackling the, the you know, the external factors uh, of the mental health. Uh, as we know that there is mental, uh, there is internal factor and external factor. And we try to alleviate the external factor that we can manage uh, in, in timely matter in, in terms of uh, 
uh, compensations in terms of uh, uh, pay leave and in terms of uh, wages. So we tried as much as possible that we, it will be not delayed and they have all their funds available in their account on time. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Dr. Farhad. Um, so, um, uh, Ali, Ali Shihab, um, a question was around internet connections for ships. Um, I think you've already covered this a little bit, but do you, do you think the industry recognises the importance of ship having good, reliable interconnect connections? Is it recognised enough? You know, I mean, is, do you think there's still some work to be done to sort of stress that importance in, 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 uh, in, in communications? I think uh, the, the pace we are going through, uh, obviously, uh, it's going fast but it's not reaching to the potential that we're looking for. Uh, I wrote uh, in many occasions uh, that looking at the development that we are seeing, it takes me back into the time, uh, uh, you remember in the 1999 and you know this, the changeover into 2000 and everybody was you know hyped up with that situation, what's gonna happen with the PCs, everything gonna crash and everything. So basically, the comprehension and the realization of that stage, i.e. 1999, December 30th, and then everybody, you know, we had even uh, sort of, uh, um, there was a plan and everybody was standing by and the PCs could crash and everything. Now, and then, you know, it went very smooth. Nothing happened, yeah? And, and basically, the comprehension, level of comprehension was not there you know, because we are not uh, computer specialists. We are more of uh, an industry and we're trying to cope with that change that's coming. And here is going to happen the same thing. You are going through a transition period where it's a, a very fast development, energy transition, technological development, and uh, as well as, uh, you know, with all this crisis that's going around you. I mean, today is another crisis in the, was in the Red Sea or whatever. Uh, with all those crises and development that's happening, I wrote on many occasions that we need a generation skip. You know how courage sometimes skips a generation within a family? Sometimes, you know, you got a dip in the family and then it goes up. And then it's very much the same here. I think we need five to ten years where we will see something totally different and very positive. Uh, the way I'm, you know, my thinking is we're going to have a way much different in five years' time. Uh, and, and where the connection, uh, the connectivity from shore to ship will be so developed that we can recognize the opportunities which we are missing now. We are missing a lot of opportunities because we are not realizing of the potential opportunities that are there. So definition of an opportunity is only if you see it. So that's, that's basically what it is. But then what I, what, I, what, what I wrote here is, you know, we as an industry, and based on what we have been discussing, I know I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, hijacking the microphone here again, but it's really basically is to advocate and provoke everybody's thought that's uh, there. And I, I, sorry, I couldn't see Andy uh, there, but, uh, and also Andy's from, from his side. Education and training for ship and, sh and, and shore staff. Uh, senior staff on board must have special training. Ship designated manning is very important. And imagine if you have class of ships, you have a designated manning for that, that will help a lot. You know, don't take me from one environment to another, from one environment each time I disembark and I join the ship. No, but when I have my team, the people who are back to back, that helps a lot and gives that trust and confidence and relax the people. Now, ship shore connectivity, i.e. social media and TV programs, internet, there is fantastic solutions by so many providers today, and it is really not so costly. Nevertheless, uh, uh, that needs really to be pursued by the company and try to improve the situation. Company officer seminars, ship and shore. I talked about it before. That also needs, there is a large opportunity, uh, you know, for this or a great opportunity for this to, to be developed. Uh, Captain Dr. Yasser just before talked about competency management system. Again, you take me back to 2008, where we managed to do the competency management system. And the reason behind it, because of the regulation, tanker management self-assessment, 
we wanted to get level four in that element, I think element number three in the TMSA. And we did manage just by having the competency management system in place and get it done. HR teams ashore needs specialists, like what we have here, with all due respect to everybody, but what we have here, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Fahad. Dr. Fahad is a medical, he leaves the seminar now, he goes to the clinic, meets with the people and attend to their health needs. But he is, an, uh, 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 he is also an occupational health specialist. Now, what do you need extra on, on top of that? You need a psychiatrist. So when I was doing the officer seminar ashore, I used to bring to part of the program a psychiatrist to do a team build up quizzes. And then if you can imagine what we did get out of that was fantastic. Need industry uh, uh, collaboration to help shipping companies, whether through these uh, subsidies, levies, tax, etc. Wherever is going to come uh, in time, what we talked about, like previously on the technological development with the R and Ds, that they cannot function without the funding. But similarly, here when we come to the human resource, certain so, allocation to help the industry to reach where it needs to do, and that brings us to the flag state intervention on the various issues that we have. They have to help the industry, and then for every individual, and, and, I, and I salute UAE, uh, frankly speaking, for ADNOC, what they have done. Uh, they, they've vaccinated everybody, and they're trying to vaccinate everybody, irrespective of nationality, gender, or whatever, and, and so on, yeah? So that is, uh, then, you know, when you get into the vaccination uh, priority uh, access, et cetera, that we talked about before. These are the notes I, I wanted to share with you. Thank you. I don't know if Roger or Andy has any comments on the internet issues. I mean, are you seeing this as being an issue that the industry needs, you know, that the, the uh, consistency of internet availability to crew on board, is it an issue that's contributing to mental health problems or? Uh, Andy here, if I'm. Go on, Andy. I'm oh, sorry, Andy first, followed by Roger. I was I was just going to say, as I sort of some said earlier, really, that I think one of the things that our We Care program tries to identify is how do you ensure that the use of the internet is done in a way that is healthy and helping people to flourish, rather than making people more isolated than they already are. Uh, so I think that's all about education and learning and making sure that people are prepared before they go on board ship. But also, we still see many times seafarers who don't have access for whatever reason their company only allow minimal amount of access so while things are improving i still think there's a way to go as well to ensure that all seafarers have the same level of access you know sort of no matter what class roger do you want to follow that up no i mean yeah i mean just following from andy says you know i i, I think i think the idea that every seafarer has 24-hour access is a, is a myth i mean seafarers are still having to pay for for, for access and you know to pay quite a lot for, for access and uh, I think we we need to move where seafarers get get better access uh, and you know also you know, uh, that there are you know, uh, uh, as we have in you know shoreside in our jobs the limitations to to you know amount of time we can spend um, at work on, on on the web sort of browsing etc and it, it doesn't you know it doesn't need a a sort of rigid regime, you know, the, the, the you know, common sense needs to prevail to ensure that seafarers have access, but also that they, they have, uh, they're able to sleep and, and rest and not to be uh, surfing for 24 hours. Um, but no, I, I think there's still some way to go for, for seafarers to get, um, you know, better access. Well, thanks very much. I'm, we, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We're now 25 past 11. I don't know where the time's gone. It's it's flown by very quickly. So um, we, we have sort of five minutes or so be before we end this webinar. So I, I'd like to, at, at the beginning, I sort of posed the, uh, the question that I, I think, and everybody knows that seafarers have done a tremendous job um, throughout the pandemic. They, they kept world trade flowing and we should all be enormously grateful to them. But we know that that's come at a cost that they that many of them have suffered uh, de deprivation in terms of not being able to see the loved ones uh, as they would like and, and, and have been subject to stresses and, and strains that perhaps uh, if, if they weren't there before, they were not there at the level that they, they are now. So I think we all agree there's a problem. 
But I also wondered whether the pandemic has actually helped in some case in moving the conversation on to another level um, and that therefore there is reason to be optimism that, the, that those that lagging behind in the industry in terms of accepting their mental health as an issue um, are now coming along line and maybe there's greater awareness am, amongst crew. So I'm just going to go ask everybody, I mean, I, in, in terms of looking at how the future looks for the industry dealing with seafarer mental health, are you more optimistic now than you were or are you more pessimistic? Um, I'm going to start with Roger because he's top of my screen at the moment. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, for no other reason than that. But um, how do you assess when you did you think the pandemic has it perversely been a force for good in terms of uh, promoting seafarer mental health? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's, 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 it's put the spotlight on, on, on the mental well-being of seafarers. And, you know, as, as some of the panelists have mentioned, you know, companies are doing more. But I, I mean, since the pandemic, we, we've had more companies come to come to us. We we run helplines now for uh, for, for for nine companies, uh, emotional support helplines and more are coming to us. We're we're doing a lot more training around mental well-being. We, we only started our online mental health training uh i think it was in in in, in october november and already we, we we've kind of got got um courses booked to, to to the end of the year you know we're working with, with a number of companies so i think companies now are realizing they they, they need to pay attention and, and as some, some of the previous parents have said it, it's not just about you know providing training helplines uh going through a tip box exercise it's about changing the culture uh, and I think, as Andy said, it's about destigmatizing mental health. And, and I think one of the other positive things I, I did mention is the way the industry has come together around the pandemic. Uh, you know, the corporations, for instance, between ship owners and the unions, you know, we've seen the Neptune Declaration and a number of other initiatives. And, and I, I think that, you know, that, that is a positive thing that's come out. And, you know, I think, I think we all hope that, that that will continue going forward. We have, we have a common purpose a common interest in, in the welfare of seafarers and uh, I, I think there's a lot more you know we, we can do together. Reverend Andy Bellman would you like to sort of well, how do you sort of are you, are you more optimistic than pessimistic? Uh, I am very optimistic um, I, I see a lot of hope I see a sense that at last there is the potential for seafarers to receive some of the credit that they deserve. I think the reality is that mental health issues have been raised across the world, not just within the maritime sector, but across the world. People have become aware that being locked down, being isolated, being separated from other people has an impact on your mental health. I still sense we're at a pivot point. I think we haven't done enough analysis over some of the cultural nuances and differences mm -hmm. when responding or, or thinking about mental health. Um, I think there's more training and equipping to be done of kind of crews, um, both those shore side, those at sea. But yeah, I'm, I'm really optimistic. And I, I always, whenever I go on board ship and people are struggling, I always get them to try and describe and remember a, a moment of great joy, because I think there is something about joy in helping us to resist some of the struggles and seafarers have some wonderful joyful stories to tell uh, so that that fills me with hope okay thank you very much andy um dr yasser do you want to make some final reflections on on, on how you perceive whether 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 there is grounds for optimism yes, i mean um, i actually share the same level of optimism that uh, the other panelists have already shared so if we look at the education and training side, what we have seen due to the pandemic and its global nature, there have been a change even in the regulatory response. So previously, some regulators were very reluctant to accept remote lecturing, cloud-based simulator training and so on. Right now, we see remote lecturing being accepted, although on a temporary basis. Uh, cloud-based simulator, there are some ears, open ears now towards accepting it as a form of training. So uh, the pandemic itself has accelerated the rate of acceptance of new technology, even at the conservative the regulator side. So I think I'm quite optimistic that uh, the nature of the pandemic being global have allowed us actually to share the same struggles all together over the whole globe and be able to communicate. You know, even our regulators all over the world, actually they share the same kind of uh, ch challenges and uh, difficulties. So there is now some sort of uh, global level of acceptance, global level of uh, 
not necessarily acceptance let me say it open ears to receive to accept new ideas and embed it into the regulations so i'm quite optimistic thank you very much dr yasser um dr farhad uh, uh, i mean you're somebody who sees it on a daily basis so your perspective is particularly valuable um are you a little bit more optimistic than you were say six months ago uh, yeah, sure, I'm optimistic, um, but my concern, or my 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 biggest concern, is that the reaction we've seen is just a reaction, is not a methodological or constructed uh, build-up toward a sustainable change. Um, uh, my my uh, my uh, hope is that we capitalize on the current situation where people right now. It's an irony, and it is, you know that, that population, all the population suffered and t tasted some of the isolation through either the quarantine or through the lockdown, and they know what's the suffering the CPR go through their working period. So I think it is right now um, when we talk to the people on the personal level, they will know when you say isolation or being away from the loved one, how that that feels to them. Uh, but I think what we need right now is a consolidation on the uh, the current situation and try to have a quick win. And then we have to keep in mind the difference in generation. I think we really need to invest a lot on the younger CFRL generation and uh, the people on the office and growing uh, agent. Uh, and we make sure that they put the CFRL mental health in the, the, in the front and on the top. And, and don't, they shouldn't treat the seafarer as a boot on the vessel and they are just number on the vessel. We have to make more effort and try to listen to them and treat them on personal level. Okay, thank you very much. To um, Ali Shihab, um, what, what's, your, what's your perspective? I mean, has, has, the, has the crisis moved the debate about mental health of seafarers onwards permanently, would you say? Can I be the last? Uh, I want Chris to, to go first. Okay, well. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, as I opened um, at the start of the conference a couple of hours ago, um, I said we, we raised this issue pre-pandemic in November 2019. Andy Berman was one of our panellists there when we were raising these issues, looking at um, what can and can't be done. So I am more optimistic that the pandemic has given greater awareness, not just for seafarers, but everyone around the world. I think everyone has um, been suffering from the lockdowns, as other panellists have said. So I think that the issue is out there. And again, one of the things we have to focus on in our industry, I mean, as we all know, it is a predominantly male industry. Most seafarers are actually men. And one of the issues we discussed pre-pandemic is that men are more inclined to um, just sit there and keep it inside them. And they're not going to, you know, th their friends tell them to man up if they want to talk about an issue. Women are more inclined to go and talk to their friends, have issues put on the table. I mean, clearly I'm not a medical doctor and I have no training in this to say that. But generally in my circle of friends, that would be true, that men are more inclined to keep it to themselves and women are more inclined to put it out there. So I think on that basis, with the awareness of the pandemic and everything that's gone on, then people are maybe more inclined to come forward. And if we're seeing an increase in reported cases, um, that might be partially to do with the pandemic and partially due to the fact that awareness is more there and people are more willing to come forward now. Um, I don't know, I have no stats to verify that, but maybe awareness of um, the issues and the ability to get help has caused an increase in helpline calls and that can only be beneficial for those that need it. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Ali Shihab. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I think the future is very uh, optimistic because the subject of transparency, yeah, transparency is growing day by day. And you know, like today, if uh, any one of us wants to voice their opinion, you, you could, you know, through social media, through webinars, through whatever, yeah. So therefore, when it comes into, yeah, because it's a gear system, so seafarers and the maritime industry is one of that system, and it's just turning and it's growing and it's developing on the same rhythm. But we've been talking about seafarers and seafarers and seafarers and seafarers. I want to share with you some, some numbers here. 
This is very important. So up to 2018, one of the reports, uh, is it 2018? No, it's actually uh, May, May, yeah, May 21st. That's on the Maritime Post. So what we have, total number of seafarers that we have, 1,650,000. 775 are officers and 875 are ratings. And by the way, you know, giving the woman seafarer their eligible right, uh, unfortunately, they make only 2% out of that, which is about 33,000 uh, female seafarers out there. And I go back into what uh, Dr. Fahad mentioned earlier about, you know, you need mechanisms that to be adapted and, uh, you know, sort of you have to uplift the system to cope with all of that change. Now, the current supply and demand indicates a shortage of seafarers looking at the development that's happening. Yeah, size of the fleet and what's what's happening there. Uh, 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 there is a shortage about of of eight percent of seafarers when we look into the future. Now, when, where is my concern? Yeah, I'm optimistic, but I'm going to give you a bit of concerns there. Looking at the casualty reports, incidents, accidents from the uh, European Maritime Safety Agency, you can go on their website and there is fantastic data out there. Yeah. So an average for the past five years, there is a, a, a 3,240 uh, casualty reports and incidents, accidents that took place. Now, there is an increase that's happening when you look in the five years up to 2018. There is an increase of 14.5 or let's say 15 percent, an increase in the rate. And that's growing now from 2018 until now. The data is actually look, look worse. Now, serious casualties out of that, it makes 2.5 percent. Yeah. Go to the more serious and focusing more on the serious casualties that are happening. 53 of that are fatalities, 941 are injured persons. Now, going back into 2017 and what Chris, Chris mentioned earlier, UK PNI Club in 2017 classified as seafarers' mental health in their spotlights. They, they brought it into their programs and they can see that the suicide is the top cause of death, making 50% of the reported fat, uh, fatalities out there. Now, the International Maritime Health Journal also estimated 5.9 or let's say 6% of death at sea connected to, to suicide and also on another uh, area where they, 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 the percentage is looking more and more. Suicide cases, are a result of mental health situations, captivity, you know, being like what Andy was mentioning before, people feeling isolated, disconnected, no reach. And I, as I started with the, with the webinar, I said to you, people feel helpless unless we are out there. I'm talking, in, you know, I'm just giving a general statement, but I know we're doing a lot, but really there is more work needs to be done. And it's all back into transparency, how we communicate with our people, our teams, how we portray, what is the notion here, yeah? And I think we're doing a good job, but unfortunately, success is very slow, very, very slow. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you very much for those words. I, I found it a, a fascinating webinar, and I think it's uh, very topical. Today happens to be World Health Day. It has to be fascinating. I'm with you. We're, we're, we're <laughs> But Stating the obvious. <laughs> it's appropriate that we're here for World Health Day, but I think it's also, uh, I, th I think that I, 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 we, 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 the first last question was around optimism, and I think I am optimism because I think more people understand mental health because it's affected them. I think we are, if we're not careful, we are on the cusp of a mental health pandemic as well as a, you know, a viral pandemic because I think so many people, and it will affect people in different ways, just as the, the COVID uh, can make people very sick or even die, mental health can make people feel unwell but you know it's something they, they sort of get along with but I think we all uh, we all know now that mental health isn't something that happens to other people it happens to us you know I think we've all uh, to a greater or lesser extent during the pandemic experienced uh, mental health maybe on a salami slicing rather than a 
catastrophic basis, but it has affected us. And I think that gives me grounds for hope in that people who are making decisions about seafarer or well-being will have a greater understanding themselves. And so won't just say, oh, that's something I don't have to bother with. Uh, but whether my, whether I'm naive or whether that, that's, uh, that, that, that feeling that this is something that has joined us all up, um, will actually be translated into some positive actions over the next few years remains to be seen. But uh, uh, it, it's good to see that people do feel that there is the basis on which there is a, uh, there can be a sustained embedded change in the approach to seafarer mental health, which I'm sure will be welcome to everybody. I, I'd like to say thank you to all the all the panelists, um, to, uh, to Chris Peters, to Ali Shehab, um, to Andy Bowerman, who I think has just dropped off just as I was about to say his name, um, Dr. Farhad, um, uh, Dr. Yasser and uh, Roger Harris. Um, we briefly had Ray Deeks with us, but I think he had technical problems, but thank you to, to him as well. Thank you to all the audience members who stuck with us over the last two hours. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. Um, we approach Ramadan. I think Ramadan starts um, next month, so I, I wish you well for Ramadan. The, the, the webinar series will take a break for a, a, a few months while, while, while that period um, uh, passes through, and, but hopefully we will, we will come back with a a new program in the in the future so i'm saying farewell for the time being please stay safe once the webinar closes you'll be redirected to a survey do let us know your thoughts we can only make these better if we get feedback from people outside so uh, please take a, a short moment and uh, well thank you all again and uh, well, we'll see you soon goodbye Bye -bye.